Uh, and uh, the first presentation is from Hujjatul uh, Islam, Sheikh Majid Hadi Zada. Uh, he's originally from Isfahan and is going to present his talk about philosophical changes at Isfahan Seminary, Al Hawza Al Almiya. Uh, the presentation is in Persian and can be translated into English. It's okay? Bismillah ar Rahman ar Rahim. Alhamdulillah wa al-Aqla. Wa salatu ala al-Nabiy wa al-Ahla. Mawzu'i این صحبت بنده که سعی می کنم برای تسهیل امر مترجمین خیلی شمرده و آرام خدمت شما مطلب رو عرض بکنم برشی از حوزه فلسفی اصفهان در دو قرن یازدهم و دوازدهم هجری قمری است به عنوان نمونه ای از حوزه های علمیه شیعی که به صورت عملی فرایند تکامل اندیشه های فلسفی فقط به عنوان نمونه مانند افکار و اصولی فقهی و دیگر علوم در این حوزه رو به نمایش در بیاورد عرایز بنده از دو قسمت اصلی تشکیل میشه در قسمت اول چهار نکته رو برای تبیین موضوع خدمت شما عرض میکنم الف منظور از فلسفه اسلامی در این عنوان فلسفه سینوی با تقریر متأخر جناب خاج نسیر است نه مثلا تقریر ابن رشدی حکمت اسلامی به حوزه زمانی مورد نظر ما اگرچه تقریبا از سال 400 که ابو علی مسکوی در اصفهان به فلسفه ورزی اشتغال داشت و 421 که از دنیا رفت شروع میشه و تقریبا تا 1355 قربه به هفتاد سال پیش 55 قمری که حکیم شیخ محمد خراسانی آخرین فیلسوف بزرگ اسفهان رهلت کرد این دوره تقریبا 950 ساله رو در بر میگیره اما تمرکز ما بیشتر بر روی دو قرن یازدهم و دوازدهم و فقط دو طبقه از حکمای اصفهان خواهد بود جیم حوزه جغرافیایی مورد نظر ما در تقریر اولیه همه منطقه اصفهان یعنی از ری تا جبال رو در بر میگیره اما در این دوره ای که عمدتا مورد نظر ماست اصفهان پایتخت رسمی یک حکومت سیاسی میشه و لذا خود این شهر رو ما بیشتر مد نظر داریم اگرچه توابع او در همه این منطقه گسترده هم شامل این صحبت خواهد بود دال روش بحث ما و نوع این صحبت تراس پژوهانه هست نه تاریخی و نه جامعه شناسی فلسفه اما سمرات او به ویژه در بحث جامعه شناسی و شناخت فضای اجتماعی فلسفه میتواند سمر داشته باشد و آخرین نکته این که این 
صحبت بنده صرفاً یک نمونه هست ما در همه حوزه های فلسفی اسلامی در جوامع شیعی و حوزه های کلامی در حوزه های اهل سنت ایران نمونه های این مطلبی که عرض می کنم رو به راحتی پیدا می کنیم در داخل ایران حد اقل که مورد مثال ما هست حوزه های شیعی و سنی در این مطلب کاملا با هم مشترک هستند با ذکر این چند نکته امیدوارم موضوع صحبت ما تا حدودی روشن شده باشه و اما بخش دوم که مطلب اصلی بنده هست این هست که میدانیم که جناب شیخ الرئیس ابن سینا پونزده سال آخر عمر خودش که بارورترین و پرسمرترین دوره حیات علمی ایشون هست رو در اصفهان گذرانده در این دوره گذشته از الهیات شفا، گذشته از بخش بزرگی از قانون رساله مبدع و معاد، رساله ازهویه و به ویژه الاشارات و تنبیهات یعنی بخش عمده آثار اصلی ایشون در همین دوره پونزده ساله در اصفهان نوشته شده تا سال 428 که شیخ رهلت میکنه خب حوزه فلسفی اصفهان در اون دوره خیلی قوی هست ابو علی مسکوی و طبقه تلامیز اینها که اتفاقا ابو علی یک سوء حزی داشته و اون این که به خاطر تشابه در کنیه بعضی از آثارش به مجموعه مصنفات اون هم کنیه نامورترش منتقل شده یعنی بعضی از آثار ابو علی مسکوی به نام ابو علی ابن سینا ثبت شده و طبقات تلامیز اینها و طبقات تلامیز پایین تر اینها که تقریبا حکمت مشاع رو در سراسر جهان اسلام توضیح کردن یعنی یک طبقه بعد از ابو علی امثال بهمن یار و ابن زیله و یک طبقه بعدتر فرید و دینه ارز کنم نوشته است به حقیقی که منهو انتشارت الحکمت و به خراسان و طبقات بعد تا از سال 428 تا سال 1006 که میر داماد وارد اصفهان میشه حدودا 600 سال حرکت فلسفی بسیار قوی در حوزه اصفهان داری شاهد او دو مطلب است یک با دقت بر این کلمه عرض می کنم نه به عنوان تخمین وجود چند هزار تکرار می کنم خدمت شما وجود چند هزار اثر فلسفی و کلامی پدید آمده در این دوره و دو سلسله متصل اساتید و شاگردان که به سنت مشعل فلسفه کلام عرفان و البته به عنوان مقدمه منطق رو از طبقات پایین به طبقات بالا متصل کردند تقریبا 600 سال دوره درخشان این وسط موجوده اما ما به خاطر قلت وقت این رو رها می کنیم و از سال 1006 که میره داماد به اصفهان هجرت کرده شروع میکنیم که شاهد عرض ما اینجا هست ملاحظه میفرمایید که در این دوره سه فیلسوف تراز اول اما از سه نهله مختلف از سه گرایش کاملا متفاوت در اسفهان حضور دارند که مشابهت هایی با هم دارند من جمله این که هر سه نفر از سنت فلسفی مشاع برخواستند اما میر داماد که البته نقش بیشتری نسبت به شیخ بهایی و جناب میر فندرسکی دارد جلچ همین است که اولا 
به عنوان جمله معترض عرض می کنم اولا شیخ بهایی خب ده سال زودتر از میر داماد رهلت فرمود و دوم این که مرجع امور شرعی رسمی حکومت و مردم بود یعنی کسرت رسائل و استفتاعاتی که از ایشون به جامانده نشون میده که نسبت به جناب میر داماد فعالیت های فقهی و شرعی بیشتری داشته و در این حال میدانیم که یک سفر هفت ساله هم به طرف بیت الله الحرام و بعضی دیگر از مناطق داشت و لذا فعالیت فلسفی کمتری داره میر فندلسکی هم اگرچه ده سال بعد از میر داماد رهلت فرمود یعنی 1030, 1040, 1050 این ستن اگرچه ده سال بعد از میر داماد رهلت کرد اما سفرهای مکرر به هند و گرایش های خاص شخصیتی ایشون اجازه نمیداد که اونطوری که میر داماد به این علوم اشتغال داشت ایشون بتواند به فعالیت فلسفی بپردازه به خاطر کم بودن وقت من سعی می کنم که نکات اصلی رو خدمت شما عرض بکنم از این جمله معترضه بگذریم در یک دوره جناب میر داماد از حکمت یمانی صحبت میکنه و مؤسس حکمتی است به نام حکمت یمانی در همون دوره عیناً شیخ بهایی از حکمت ایمانی صحبت میکنه که البته مبانی حکمت ایمانی خیلی ترسیم و تفسیر نشده به خاطر اینکه جناب شیخ کمتر به تعلیفات فلسفی پرداخته و در همون دوره جناب میر فندرسکی از حکمت سر صحبت میکنه به خاطر سلسله اساتید خاص ایشون چلبی بیک تبریزی که به ابن ترکه بدون واسطه به ساین الدین ابن ترکه میرسه و از طریق او به جمال الدین محمود شیرازی و میره در سلسله حکمای استراباد که نسیمی و امادی و مکتب حروفیه و فلان از اونجا تولید شده و حتی نظر خاص ایشون به عالم طبیعیات که در رسائل کیمیاوی ایشون بیشتر محقق شده و به گونه ای نشوندهنده شخصیت خیالی جابر ابن حیان و متقدمی نیست که همین اندیشه ها رو تفسیر می کرده اند این سه حکیم با سه اندیشه کاملا مستقل یعنی سه نوع فلسفه منحاز و مستقل از هم سه فلسفه کاملا جدای از هم حکمت یمانی و حکمت ایمانی و حکمت سر که خود جناب میر فندرسکی از اضافه کردن یا نسبت به این کلمه و گفتن حکمت سری عبا دارد حکمت سر رو برش اصرار دارد اینها در یک طبقه در اصفهان همزمان با هم به فعالیت فلسفی مشغولن هم شاگردانی دارند هم آثاری تولید می کنند و هم در نقد و رد هم تلاش می کنند و در این حال هیچ مشکلی هم از نظر فلسفی از نظر اعتقادی در این حوزه پر شور پدید نمی آن. همینجا باید این طبقه رو رها بکنیم و اشاره بکنیم به طبقه بعد که جناب میر سید احمد علوی عاملی دارد به عنوان بزرگترین خلیفه میر داماد و پسر خاله و داماد ایشون دارد از حکمت یمانی دفاع میکنه همون موقع در همون طبقه صدر المتعلهین دارد حکمت متعالیه رو بنیانگذاری میکنه 
و باز همون موقع و در همون طبقه جناب ملا رجبلی تبریزی که 1080 رهلت کرد دارد در اصفهان اندیشه حکمت تنظیحی خودش رو پایو گذاری میکنه ببینید فقط در دو طبقه در یک دوره معاصر ما در اصفهان چند مکتب مستقل داریم به جز حکمت اشراق که ماده فکر میره داماد رو تشکیل میده اگرچه صورت فکر ایشون است، اما ماده فکر ایشون است. به جز حکمت اشراق که بروز چندانی اینجا نداره همه نهله ها و روش های فلسفی موجود در تاریخ فلسفه ما در این دوره در اصفهان یا پدید میاد یا مثل حکمت مشا به اوج میرسه یعنی عمده شروع شفا عمده حواشی اشارات به شروع این شروح این کتاب و دیگر آثار بزرگ ما مال همین دوره در همین شهر هست گذشته از او حکمت یمانی حکمت ایمانی حکمت سر حکمت تنزیهی ملا رجبلی و حکمت متعالیه پنج نهله بزرگ همزمان در اصفهان پدید آمده و کار کرد و اینقدر ترابط اینها با هم زیاده که اولین ناقد حکمت متعالیه به عنوان نمونه استاد ایشون جناب میر داماد در افق مبینه که خیلی سریح میفرماید یک وقت فکر نکنی این حرف نتیجهش اصالت الوجوده با یک وقت فکر نکنی این حرف به حرکت جوهری میرسه یعنی رسما مبانی شاگرد خودش رو نقد میکنه از اون طرف کسی مثل عبدالرزاق لاهیجی که یکی از دو شاگرد بزرگ صدرا هست هم آراء استاد خودش رو نمیوزیره یعنی استاد و شاگرد هر دو این وسط یک نفر رو نقد میکنن اما هیچ مشکلی هم پیش نمیآید نگاه به فضای غیر شیعی این حوزه در عرض یک دقیقه عرض بکنم که فرصت تمام نشه هم نشون دهنده اهمیت این حوزه هست ببینید بعضی از متکلمین مسیحی مثل هنری مارتین و کسان دیگری که مشهور هستند آثاری می نویسند در نقد اسلام همون موقع یک موجی در اصفهان تولید میشه که مسقل صفای میر سعید احمد معروفترینشه اگرچه معروفترین چون مختصره و الا آینه ی حق نمایه ایشون که متاسفانه یک نسخه هم بیشتر ازش موجود نیست خیلی کاملتر و جامعتر از مسقل صفاست اما چون چاپ نشده بهش اشاره نمی کنم. شما این کتاب رو که ملاحظه بفرمایید یک کلمه تند و اهانتامیز از ابتدا تا انتهاش نه از ایشون نه از اوشون به چشم نمیخوره دو در همون موقع اهل کلام و اهل فلسفه یا اهل سنت در اصفهان به راحتی مشغول فعالیت هستند نمونه شمس الدین محمد اصفهانی شارح قدیم که بزرگترین شرح تجرید رو در دوره قدیم تعلیف کرده و چند قرن اثر ایشون در بین شیعه ها و اهل سنت درسی بوده تا همین دوره که فخر الدین سماکی در اصفهان کار فلسفی می کرده و میر داماد محضر ایشون رو در کرده همه از حکمای اهل سنت اصفهان هستند که هیچ مشکلی برای کار فلسفی و کلامی در اصفهان نداشتند به خاطر اینکه یک دقیقه فرصت باقی است جمع مطلب رو عرض بکنم اگرچه متاسفانه مواد باقی ماند که انشاءالله در مقاله خدمت شما ارائه می کنند ببینید 
جهان امروز ما نیازمند به این گفتگو هست و این گفتگو بهترین بستری که پیدا می کند در حوزه فلسفه هست و این فلسفه در جای جای دنیا چنین سمرات مثبت و درخشانی داشته اما من فقط به عنوان نمونه این حرکت در جهان اسلام به این دو قرن در اصفهان اشاره کردم که اولا پنج نهله نیرومند تولید میکنه دهها فیلسوف تراز اول دهها مدرس تراز اول و آثار بینظیر آثاری که خیلی کم نمونه اونها پدید آمده به وجود میاد در داخل شیعه در فضای شیعه و اهل سنت و حتی در فضای شیعه و خارج از جهان اسلام و این اون چیزی است که ما امروز در جهان معاصر به شدت به او نیازمندیم از حسن استماع همه شما سپاسگزارم و سلام علیکم و رحمت الله و برکاته my friend, uh, Mr. Haji Zadeh. And uh, uh, now we, are, we listen to the next uh, presentation by Dr. Mohsen Javadi from the Qom University. He's originally from the city of Qom, studied at the re uh, religious uh, seminary, Islamic seminary, Al Hawza Al Miya. and graduated from Tarbiyat Mudarris University and now is a professor in Qom University in the field of philosophy, I think. His presentation is about Shia practical theology. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. In the name of Allah. At first, I would like to thank the organizers of this conference, especially my dear brother, Dr. Mujani, for his help with different steps of arranging this conference. And the second point, I think my English presentation needs no translation because it is in Farsi. And the third point is that I'm not talking about the Esfahan, Maktab Esfahan or Esfahan philosophy. I'm talking about the practical theology, Shia practical theology. Yeah. At first, I need uh, to give some definitions. As you know, religion, uh, this is the definition of Farabi in his famous book, Kitab al Millah. The book of religion. Uh, religion has two parts, opinions and actions. Um, al -afal. Religious opinion is the description of God and spiritual and human beings, a sort of human anthrop anthropology and description of God, their ranks in themselves and their stations in relation to God. The study of these opinions was called Fiqh al-Akbar, which is comparable to dogmatic theology in Christianity. This distinction is from Farabi, Fiqh al-Akbar, Fiqh al-Asghar, or comprehension of Ara, opinions, comprehension of Af'al. Uh, note that Fiqh is used in the general sense of understanding here, and not merely for jurisprudence as in common usage today. By actions, we refer to actions and words by which God is praised, like rituals, prayers, as well as the obligations we have in relation to each other and to ourselves. The study of these actions was called fiqh al-asghar, and today is commonly understood as jurisprudence. Uh, one of the main point of Shia understanding of Islam is that religion is not arbitrary. Religion uh, has, you know, bases in reality. 
opinions based on truth and actions based on the good. Uh, it is necessary to refer to uh, one philosophical point. Uh, in Islamic philosophy, they distinguish between two reason or two intellect or two aspects of intellect. They are talking about theoretical reason and practical reason. Theoretical reason aims at truth, but practical reason aims at good. So there is good and there is uh, truth. The relation between good and truth uh, is uh, so complicated and need more time to be explained, but I'm not here dealing with this you know, uh, issue. So the opinion based on truth, but the action based on the good. Uh, one of the main differences between the good and truth is this. In the case of truth, in the case of opinions, we are just, uh, you know, uh, are passive uh, with regard to the reality, reflect the truths of the reality in our mind. But with respect to the action, we want to change the world in accord to our understanding, to our plan. So we are active, not passive. So this is the distinction between uh, truth and good. The, also, the opinions and actions of religion were determined and restricted through divine revelation to the prophets. But truth and the good are their basis, respectively. Truth are the base of opinion, and the good uh, is the base of action. When we come to the philosophy, uh, we have also two sorts of philosophy, theoretical, practical. Theoretical philosophy is the knowledge and discovery of those truths we are not able to do when we know them. But practical philosophy is the knowledge of what we can do when we know it. As I told earlier, that in the, in the case of practical philosophy, like practical you know, um, issue, we can change the world in accord to our plan, to our desires. But in the case of theoretical knowledge, we are only the mirror of the nature, mirror of the world. So also philosophy, uh, you know, based, uh, theoretical philosophy based on truth and practical philosophy based on the good. But the procedure of grasping the uh, knowledge in philosophy and in, uh, you know, religion is different. In philosophy, we, uh, you know, come uh, from the procedure of demonstration, uh, base our knowledge on the truth, our, our practical knowledge on, on the good. So all, by good, I mean the good of human being, the good of humanity, the good of, you know, uh, like eudaimonia or happiness or uh, well-being. Also theoretical and practical philosophy were determined by the philosophers through demonstration. They are based on truth and the good. So you can see that the basis of religion and the basis of philosophy are the same. We are seeking truth and the good through revelation in the case of religion and through demonstration in the case of uh, philosophy. This is the main point of uh, my paper. So this is from Farabi, the functions of philosophy. According to Farabi, philosophy has two functions in relation to religion. In the case of theoretical you know, issues of religion or opinions, proofs of religious opinions occur in philosophy. In the case of practical issue or actions, reasons for the particulars of religious actions occur in philosophy and practical philosophy. So, hence, we find a parallel structure in philosophy and religion, whereby both have theoretical and practical aspects directed toward the truth and the good, respectively. So we have a uh, third knowledge, different from philosophy and from uh, you know, comprehension of religion, or fiqhul ara, fiqhul af'al. This is fiqh, or comprehension, or jurisprudence, and uh, the second is philosophy, and the third is kalam. Corresponding to the two parts of religion, we have two sorts of kalams, or apologetics, because kalam, sometimes translated into English, into theology, but uh, is not correct translation, so it is better to be translated to apologetics. Corresponding to the two parts of religion, we have two sorts of kalam, or apologetics, which is understood as the defense of the opinions and actions of religion. 
and is not to be confused with the contemporary meaning of theology. Kalamul Ara, theoretical kalam or apologetics. Kalamul Af'al, practical kalam or apologetics. So this is the third knowledge or third, maybe sometimes kalam, it is better to be called art, not knowledge. Because, uh, you know, kalam has a defensive character and uses dialectic more than demonstration. The main purpose of kalam is defending opinions and actions. Even though we have no proof or reason for the truth or goodness of the opinions and actions. So this is the art of kalam, uh, sort of defending opinions or actions of religion. Using different, uh, you know, propositions. Uh, Sometimes using demonstration, but not necessarily... Uh, to be used, you know, we can use other sorts of uh, dialectic, rhetoric, and many things. The word kalam, which is parallel to ap apologetics in the West, usually is translated as theology, but this is not a very precise translation. It is closer to a scholastic theology or the, to the apologetics, as I told you. So when we come to the history of Islamic civilization, Theoretical kalam in the Islamic world has a rich history, and there are many arguments and justifications for the theoretical beliefs of religion, such as the existence of God, his unity and knowledge, and his providence, or the afterlife. And there were many scholars and books that defended theoretical religious claims. We have a rich history of kalam al ara many books devoted to uh, prove the existence of God, to talk about philosophically or maybe uh, rhetorically or dialectically to defend the religious opinions. But when we come to the practical side of religion, concerning actions, however, there are only a few books called The Reasons of Islamic Laws, Elal al But they are mostly collections of narration and are not developed in a rational and a systematic way. We have no, you know, good uh, uh, systematic book about defending our uh, religious actions. Yes, we have jurisprudence talking about the obligations, but jurisprudence is different from kalam. Kalam tries to defend these, uh, you know, actions, these obligations, not talking about the obligations, talking about the you know, defending these obligations. So kalam is different from fiqh or jurisprudence and also from philosophy because philosophy is not just defending the religious claim. It, talking about truth, sometimes, you know, they overlap with uh, kalam or maybe comprehension, fiqh. So we have another thing. I'm not sure that uh, this form of study uh, is common in... Uh, English philosophy or the Western philosophy. Also, I'm not sure about the history of this sort of, you know, uh, considerations because we have a book called Elahiyat bil Ma'na al Achas. We have metaphysics, but at the end of metaphysics, they uh, have a part or a discussion about uh, divinity with a philosophical uh, argumentation. So they called Elahiyat bil Ma'na al Achas. I'm not sure about Aristotle. Also, uh, may. We cannot find this form of, you know, a study in uh, the Greek philosophers, also in the West, but it is especially <laughs> uh, common in uh, Islamic philosophy books. Nearly all Islamic philosophy books have a part called Elohiyat bil Ma'na al Achas, theology in the specific sense, not in general sense as a metaphysic. In this part, one finds demonstration and proofs of the basic claims of religion, like the existence of God and his attributions and the afterlife. In practical theology, unfortunately, we have not elohiyat bil ma'na lachas in practical uh, aspect. You know, we have argumentation about the existence of God in philosophy or elohiyat bil ma'na lachas, but we have not argumentation, for example, in you know, priority of family on the value of justice and the value of many other practical side. We have not argumentation in this issue. So in practical theology, however, which concerns the reasons for the actions of religion, we do not have a developed study of the ways in which these actions can be justified 
comparable to the discussions in theoretical theology. Also, there is a practical kalam. This is limited to apologetics and does not live into the reasons for the actions defended. So even to, the, to, the, to this point, we have three things. Fiqh, fiqh ulara, comprehension of opinion, comprehension of action. Kalam, defending these claims, kalam ulara, kalam ulafal. And uh, philosophy, ph theoretical philosophy and practical philosophy. So I'm talking about the reasons or the possible reasons for absence of practical theology in our history. Why practical theology is not, was not developed like the theoretical philosophy? I give uh, four maybe possible answers to this question. We have rich history of theoretical discussion, opinions, defending opinion, justification of opinion, reasoning for opinion, but, but not, not about, you know, other side of religion, of actions. We have not so much rich history in this side. We have a rich history of jurisprudence, but not kalam, not uh, theology, not philosophy. So this is for a reason, I think, uh, they are correct, but I'm not sure. Practical questions, the, the, unfortunately, practical theology is not practiced by the philosophers, but mainly is developed by the Muslim theology and, and jurisprudence. I'm talking about this in the next slide. Practical questions before the modern age, one of the answers for this question is that, because you know, practical issue became more important in the modern age. Before modernity, there was no you know, attack on religion concerning to uh, practical issues. They deny the existence of God, they deny the afterlife, but they are not denying the, uh, for example, <laughs> practical issues of religion. Practical issue became more important in the modern age. So uh, we have not a rich history of attack uh, on religion with this issue. So we have not kalam al-af'al, we have not practical theology because there was no you know, challenge of practical issue to religion. Uh, this is, this, these are the new you know, problem for religion. So the first answer, practical questions before the modern age was not serious for uh, scholars, and the priority of theory over the actions was common. This is the uh, Aristotelian idea of the priority of theory over the action was common in Muslim uh, you know, history also. There was no challenge. Uh, practical challenge to religion. The second answer, the scholars were, af were afraid to discuss practical issues uh, because it opens the door. Because, you know, uh, mm, mm, people usually, uh, not scholars, people usually are engaged with the actions of religion, not the theoretical aspect of religion. So usually scholars, uh, we're afraid to discuss practical issues because it opens the door of skepticism and in consequence, abandonment of the required actions. This is the second answer. The third answer come from the you know, uh, governments of the Islamic uh, era, eras because mainly uh, they prevent people from discussing about justice, about the practical issues, but they are not they, was, they were not preventing them from talking about God, God's existence, as God's attributions. The practical issue related to the you know, uh, rulers, and so they have some problem with this. And scholars are usually afraid of discussing this, uh, these issues. And the fourth, there were worries about, the, uh, about not being able, because uh, scholars have some worry about that. Uh, not being able to prove or to justify all actions of religion. So they leave the whole of the project of justification of actions. Uh, there were worries about the being, uh, not being able to give um, reasons for all of the actions of religion. So uh, the final point, uh, I was just refer to the titles without, because I have no time. The titles of this and finish my paper. Grounds of Shia practical, Shiite practical theology. 
uh, Shiite practical theology, Shiite scholars, by ac ac accepting a sort of objectivism and even realism alongside with rationalism in religious actions, tried to build a framework and basis for practical theology, but they were unable to apply it in detail. There are some points, some reasons for you know, the possibility of building or grounding a uh, practical theology based on Shiite you know, teachings. Uh, some of the teachings are these, and we can find more than these. Harmony of reason and revelation, which is embodied in uh, Sharia. As you know, uh, many of Shia scholars uh, believe in the uh, essentiality of goodness and badness or reality of goodness. It is not arbitrary. It is not uh, possible just on the will, on the desire to you know, say that something is good, something is bad. The goodness or badness has an essential and uh, rooted in the reality, and also can be discovered by reason, the rationality of goodness and badness. These are the two uh, points of the Shia understanding of uh, normativity. And divan wisdom, wisdom and purposiveness, per 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 because you know, uh, most of the Muslim theologians, uh, Ash'ari theologians that reject the divine wisdom and the purposiveness of you know, God's actions. So, but uh, if we accept the purposiveness and the purpose of God in creation and divine wisdom, we can you know, ask some question about the uh, normative questions and try to find reasons for normative questions. But if we deny the purpose of God or the divine wisdom, we cannot you know, uh, pos have possibility or we cannot write to discuss about the normativity or the goodness or badness. And the final point, justice as the basis of creation and the legis legislation. And uh, <laughs> they told that the time is finished. Thank you for, uh, thanks. Okay, just to save uh, the time, we're going to the next presentation by Sajjad Rezvi. It's about Abyssinia in the Shia provenances, the rule of Mullah Mehdi Naraki as a philosopher, theologian in an age of uncertainty. Uh, Sajjad is from subcontinent India, grew up in England and graduated from the University of Cambridge. And now he's a professor of Islamic studies in University of Exeter. And the place is for you. I hope you don't mind if I, I stand here. I might walk around a bit. I think um, we should be uh, mashayun uh, in many ways, uh, <laughs> especially with me who, I, I, I have this sort of haybat, as they said about Mir Damad. So I should, uh, should always be moving. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Sayyid Ali Mujani and all the organizers for their uh, wonderful uh, hospitality, bringing us all together. It's always lovely to see old friends and, and make new ones. Um, and it's, it's especially lovely to be on a panel uh, which works so well together. Um, it's been a while since I've spoken on the panel where so many other people are talking about things which I am self, myself am also interested in. So it's, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I am going to be talking um, partly about uh, Mullah Mahdi and Araki, but I want to say something about my wider project. Um, recently, and this will continue for a while, I'm contributing uh, at least a couple of pieces to this uh, large um, German history of philosophy project uh, you know, called the Überweg. 
uh, on the history of Islamic philosophy, and in that I've been writing a series of pieces on uh, philosophy from the 17th to the 20th century, uh, particularly in Iran. And so what I'm going to talk about comes out of one particular piece I've written, which is about the course of the Avicennian tradition, uh, particularly with respect to the Avicennian tradition as, in a sense, a critique of Mullah Sadra, but not a straightforward critique, and I'll come back to that. So before I get to Naraqi, let me say something about how I understand what that Avicennian tradition is. Firstly, with respect to texts, that Avicennian tradition is reflected in the marginalia, the Havashi, which are written on three texts. The first one is the theology of the Shefa, the Ilahiyat of the Shefa, which was especially important from the 17th century, arguably to the late 19th century. Uh, there are a lot of Hawashi on this particular text. It's probably the most uh, popular work of Avicenna's, uh, which is taught and glossed. The second, uh, as was mentioned before by uh, um, Hadi Zadeh, uh, was the Isharat of, of uh, Ibn Sina, but especially the Isharat through the commentary of Khaja Nasiruddin Tusi, the Hal Mushkilat. And there are various uh, glosses written on that text as well, but much less so in the period I'm interested in, in the 17th and 18th century. And the third text is the, uh, the Shar al-Tajreed. In particular, actually, the later Shar, the earlier Shar was mentioned of Shamsuddin Isfahani, but the later Shah of Ali Qushji, who dies in 1474, and in particular, the gloss of Shamsuddin Khafri, one of the philosophers of Shiraz in the early 16th century, and then the various glosses which were written on that, particularly on the issue of the proof for the existence of God and the nature of God's attributes. So these are the th three texts and the commentary traditions on these three texts, which fundamentally define what the tradition, the sort of the tradition of Ibn Sina is uh, for us. Now, one of the interesting things is that one of the most important marginalia written on the Ilahiyat to the, Shaf the Shafa was actually by Mullah Sadwa. And some of the marginalia, for example, by Hossein Khansari, who was mentioned yesterday by um, Professor John Woolbridge, is a response to that reading. So one of my contentions about what the Avicennian tradition is in the 18th century is that it is one which is influenced by Mullah Sadra's reading of Ibn Sina. <coughs> At the... Uh, uh, Slow there, okay. because uh, the translation... Gotcha. Yeah. Thank you. The reason why I think it's an, a Mullah Sadra's reading of Avicenna, which is quite influential, it's partly because this is attested in the marginalia itself. I'll give you three examples of marginalia on the Ilahiyat, which explicitly cite Mullah Sadr's reading as the most sensible, the most critical, the most useful. The earliest is by Muhaqir Sabzawadi, Muhammad Baqir Sabzawadi, who again was mentioned by John Woolbridge yesterday, in which uh, Sabzawari consistently takes the side of Mullah Sadr against Khansari in his gloss, especially because he considers uh, Mullah Sadr's reading, particularly of the metaphysics, especially in Book One uh, of the Ilahiyat to the Shifa, to be a more sensible and critical reading. The second witness is a Hashia by someone we know very little about who's probably writing in the 1730s, and I guess is an, a distant uncle of mine, uh, Sayyid Jamaluddin Razavi, um, who has a, quite an interesting hashia on the Ilahiyat, which uh, survives in a few manuscripts. The best manuscript is in Marashi. And in that also, in the introduction, he says the best uh, hashia on the Ilahiyat is that by Mullah Sadwa. It is much uh, more philosophically interesting, again, than Khansari. 
And the third witness I'll give you is someone called Sayyid Abdul Azim Linjani from Isfahan writing in the 1810s, maybe 1820, who again says the same thing, that the best uh, marginalia which explains what's going on in the ilahiyat of the shifa is that by Mullah Sadr. So there's a sense in which that was, uh, Sadr's reading of Ibn Sina was successful. And it was successful in certain areas. It was partially successful in Sadr's uh, postulation of his idea of tashkik al-wujud, of the modulation of existence, as something which comes directly out of Avicenna and particularly comes directly out of Tusi's reading of Avicenna. Allied to this was the notion of wujud dhihni, mental existence, that to really conceptualize things, to have concepts in the mind which have a rigorous ontological foundation, you need to have this notion of mental existence, which corresponds to existence in extra mental reality, wujud khariji. And this is something which comes very much out of Mullah Sadr's reading. And of course, there were other positions which uh, were critical, uh, such as Haraka Johariya, which is uh, mentioned uh, earlier as well, uh, which people took um, issue with. But broadly, on the broad contours of the metaphysics of Avicenna, I would argue that Mullah Sadr's reading was extremely successful and was telling. And those who went against that, whether it was the Khansaris, whether it's Rajab Ali Tabrizi, whether it's Mir Fendereski, whether it was even Mahdi Naraki in certain cases, they were very much going against the trend and what is significant is that they had very little legacy. People later quote Hansari, but increasingly his reading is not taken up. Hardly anyone quotes Naraki in the later period, and there's a big question about what sort of legacy Naraki had. There are two other features of the Avicenna tradition which I want to indicate, which I've found out quite recently, and I think it's quite interesting. The first is that uh, for the 17th century in particular, but arguably even for the 18th century, Mir Damad's understanding of Avicenna was also very influential. And there's particularly one issue on which Mir Damad's position becomes known as the position of Ibn Sina. And that is basically what he says about Huduth, about Huduth Dahri. So basically that the incipience, the beginning of the cosmos is in this ontological realm known as Dahr. And this of course is not the same as Avicenna's idea of Huduth Dhati, but it becomes the dominant Avicennian reading. So much so that everyone from the later 17th century onwards, who describes themselves as a follower of Ibn Sina, effectively supports the concept of Huduth Dahri. And there are a number of individuals, and Naraki actually comes in the culmination of that tradition. So Mir Damad is very important. The other aspect which is important um, is if we go back to the famous debates in Shiraz in the 15th and early 16th century between Davani and Dashtaki, which we could see as potentially two rival versions of Avicenna. What is striking is that Davani's version of Avicenna is completely defeated in, uh, in the Iranian lands. And that's because it's gone through the filter of Mir Damad and it's gone through the filter of Mullah Sadra. So ultimately, understandings of Avicenna which go back to the Dashtakis are the ones which win out. And increasingly, especially in the later part of the 18th century, and again you see this in Naraki, the position which is often attacked in metaphysics uh, as being not a correct version of Avicenna is precisely Davani's position, which comes back again and again. The interesting thing is there is a massive contrast here between Iran, India, and the Ottoman Empire. In India and the Ottoman Empire, the Davani reading of Avicenna is actually dominant. In Iran, it is completely eclipsed. And there's an in interesting set of 
investigations which can be made there. Now, after that very long tamhid, I think I should... Yes, <laughs> I should get to Naraki. Yes, that's fine. Um, there's not much to say, actually. Um, Naraki, uh, philosophically, I would argue Naraki is the most interesting person in the 18th century. But then he's working in a context in which we're dealing not with giants, we're dealing with, with pygmies, as they say. But he's still important because in terms of methodology, I take the position which um, I always quote um, a very famous article by Richard Rorty on uh, four models of intellectual history. It's an, it's an old collection which was published in 1981, I think, which is called Philosophy in History. And in that he says that, you know, if we really want to understand the course of philosophy, we are, should uh, be aware not to focus just on the so-called great figures. We shouldn't just develop a canon of great figures, you know, sort of the Plato to NATO uh, modules or teaching things that we have um, in most universities. But rather we should also look at figures who were minor but in their own time, these were the most important teachers. In some cases, they didn't even leave works. In some cases, they did. But if you look at the contemporary witnesses, the contemporary tabaqat works, they are mentioned as the most important philosophers. And that's why we should be looking at people like Naraki in the 18th century. We should be looking at uh, people like um, uh, Muhammad Zaman Kashani. Uh, Nusha Abadi in the 18th century. We should be looking at people like Ismail Khajui. We should be looking at various Khatun Abadis uh, in the earlier part of the 18th century, despite the fact that uh, you have the famous account of the, um, the Damad of, of Mount Baq al Majlisi, and uh, if I remember correctly, it's Abdul Nabi Qazvini, who says about him that he used to teach the Ilahiyat of the Shifa, and if only he didn't teach it, it would have been better. Um, which tells you something about how philosophy actually, at this late period, remains extremely popular, and yet is not always ta taught by the most appropriate people. Now, Naraki himself, one of the points I would make about Naraki is that I think he deliberately modeled himself on Nasiruddin Tusi. And I have a few reasons for that. One is philosophically, when you look at Naraqi's Hashia on the Ilahiyat, when you look at his Jami' al Afkar, which is basically on the Shara Tajreed and the Hashias on that, when you look at uh, his Luma uh, Ilahiyah, Lama'at Arshia, uh, you see in these works positions which at their core come out of Tusi's reading of Avicenna and take that reading forward. But beyond that, he also wrote a number of works which are very much in, lie in the interest of um, Tusi. For example, he wrote works in mathematics. He wrote works in astronomy. There aren't that many works in astro astronomy and mathematics which survive from the 18th century. He also wrote a major work of akhlaq, the Jamia Sa'adat, which actually, when you look at it nowadays, the Jamia is probably Naraki's most famous work. It's the, it's the one work, if you go to the book market, you'll always see copies of the Jamia Sa'adat. You might not always see copies of the Hashi on the Ilahiyat of the Shifa. Um, and that could have a lot to do with the fact that, you know, not everyone is a geek like me reading metaphysics or, or, you know, it's like some of us who, who read these things. Most people, let's be honest, philosophy is not necessarily the most popular pastime. Um, at least with akhlaq, people have to pay lip service to why it's really important for us. Philosophy, they don't necessarily have to do that. So I think there's a sense in which um, he is very consciously modeling himself on Nasir Din Tusi and taking up the mantle. And you see that with other figures. Again, if I just give one contrast with um, the Khansaris, uh, Hussein, but especially Jamal al-Din Khansari, a number of the accounts 
which a contemporary to Jamaluddin in particular say that Jamaluddin was like a second Allah-Mahilli. And there's a conscious sense in which I think Jamaluddin Khansari was also modeling himself on the sorts of intellectual pursuits and interests someone like Allama Hilli had. And some of the honorifics which are given in Tabaqat works for Hilli are then also given for Khan Sari. Now, how much time do I have now? Three minutes. Three minutes, okay. I uh, don't think I have time for um, the detailed refutations <laughs> that Naraqi has of some of the positions of uh, Mullah Sadra. I'm just going to quickly mention some things uh, which uh, tell you something about the relationship between uh, Mullah Sadra and Naraqi. Firstly, there are certain positions which he takes um, which agree with Mullah Sadra. Um, one of them is Mullah Sadra's famous position of the ontological primacy of uh, existence, Asalat al Wujud. And to a certain extent, he accepts Mullah Sadr's position on tashkik, on modulation, except that he sticks with the traditional Tusian reading, which is that tashkik only applies to the concept. It doesn't apply to the reality of existence. And he accepts other positions. For example, Mullah Sadr's infallibilist position on knowledge, which is uh, you know, the famous identity thesis of late antiquity, the ittihad al-aql al-maqul. Alongside that, the idea that uh, the inf infallibilism in knowledge requires the human intellect to be united with the active intellect. So there has to be a position of ittihad and not ittisal, which, of course, is the Avisan position. So you can see in some of these, he is uh, taking Sadwa completely. In others, he is taking Sadwa's reading of Avicenna. And then there are positions which are critical. And one of these positions, I'll just mention this one position as the last thing, uh, relates to the famous notion of wahdat al-wujud, of monism. One of the features which I forgot to mention earlier about the Avicennian tradition in the 18th century is that it was very hostile to monism. It was very hostile to a Qunawi reading of Ibn Arabi, which is that there is a hypostatic uh, unity of existence, rahdat al shakhsi as it was called. Naraqi also is very hostile to this. But he's also hostile to the way in which that monism is articulated by Mullah Sadra. So the most extensive critiques you have, for example, in the Lama'at al-Shia, which I think Lama'at al-Shia probably is the work. If you're interested in Naraqi's philosophy, and I'm Sure, you're all absolutely fascinated and are going to go and get out of the library within hours of me saying this. Um, the work you should really look at is the Lama'at al Shia, which is edited by Ali al Jabi, because it's the one work where you have the most extensive discussion of his arguments. And the longest argument in the final chapter in that is precisely his refutation of Wahd al Wujud, in which he starts with Ibn Arabi's concept and he moves on. To to Mullah Sadra's concept. So in a sense, coming back to my introduction, that's the last feature of Avicennism in the 18th century I want to mention, is the critique of Wahd al-Wujud. There's so much more to do on that. I have collected a lot of risalas in Wahd al-Wujud. Uh, uh, there's so many in the 18th century. That's another kind of whole project which could be quite interesting. It's precisely how does the Avicennian tradition deal with the question of monism purely at a theoretical level, not interested in the kind of anti-Sufi stuff which uh, Andrew mentioned yesterday, the, the Tahir Qummi stuff about, well, Sufis are bad because they kind of go around piercing themselves and going around naked and dancing and singing. No, it's not that stuff. It's the theoretical idea, the, the threatening idea of Wahd al-Wujud because actually it does have ethical implications, but the, the metaphysical foundations of that. Again, there's a lot more I could say about Naraqi. Um, the last point I will quickly mention, because I think I'm out of time, is that he also was interested in popularizing certain ideas and taking things. You, you find in Naraqi the beginnings of one of the things which is happening in terms of the social history, which I think is interesting in Iran, 
in the 18th century is you have the beginnings of what later becomes known as the famous uh, you know, alliance between the bazaar and the ulama. And you have very close relations between Narahi and various um, merchants. And he writes these various works which are called Anise something, right? So he has a work called Anis al hukama Anis al-Tujjar, um, which is on fiqh. Uh, you have Anis al muwahidin which is basically on theology. Um, and he writes these works to basically explain fairly simple, in a simple terms, fairly simple terms, what are important things that people need to understand from fiqh, from asul, from kalam, from hikmah, and other things. And so he sees himself as having a certain public profile. In that sense, Naraki, I think, is the beginnings of something which becomes more popular in the Qajar period of what I would call a certain type of public, theological, intellectual. Very different from the court intellectuals you get in the Safavid period, where I think they're very much dealing in conversations which are court. Naraki is probably the first generation of people who think taking things outside of the court and dealing with other types of elites, merchant elites and other uh, local notables and other types of elites. And that becomes more accentuated in the Qajar period, both in Isfahan and in Tehran. So to conclude in one sentence, Naraki, really interesting guy, in the long term, completely lacking in influence and has no legacy. But if you want a certain witness to what the Abyssinian tradition and the impact that's had for Mullah Sadra is in the 18th century, he is your best guy to go to. Thank you. Very difficult and sophisticated presentation uh, because of the topic. You must be thankful to uh, Dr. Sadiq Musavi. She asked me to give you five minutes of his time. <laughs> uh, so uh, in the discussion at the end of our panel, uh, if you want to uh, give a very short uh, Persian abstract of your presentation because of uh, the problem of translation, you can, you can uh, yeah, use the time. Okay, the next presentation is by Sadiq. Would you like to present by PowerPoint? Or? No, it's okay. Sadiq Musavi, originally from Iran, graduated in Germanistic, I think, in Shahid Beheshti University in Tehran. And uh, then in the uh, PhD, Dr. PhD, his PhD from uh, Tübingen University in Islamic philosophy. And now he's a professor of uh, Persian and uh, Islamic philosophy at the same university. His uh, presentation, is talk her talk, is about School of Isfahan. It's your time. Oh, it's OK. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Sohbet man albate be. آلمانی خواهد بود ولی میخواستم که چند کلمه به زبان مادری صحبت کنم از سفارت جمهوری اسلامی ایران من تشکر میکنم به خاطر این همایش بسیار مفید و خوب که انشاءالله پیامتهاش در آینده مشاهدش خواهیم بود به خصوص از رایزن محترم فرهنگی جناب آقای سید علی موجانی و تیم بسیار خوب و فعالشون من فکر میکنم که همکاران محترم جناب آقای دکتر سجاد رزوی یا رزوی و جناب آقای حجت الاسلام هادی زاده مسائل بسیار خوبی رو در مورد مکتب اصفهان بیان فرمودند شاید همه اون چی که باید گفته میشد گفته شده ولی من نگاه خیلی اجمالی به این مکتب دارم و مثل سروران محترم وارد بحث های راجع به علما و اندیشمندان و متفکرین با اون خصوصیتی که آقایون وارد شدن من البته نخواهم شد وقت زیادی رو هم از شما نخواهم گرفت بسم الله الرحمن الرحیم من زیر فیعت دامن و هرن ایبا دی شول فون ایس و هن سوشپریشن هست konkret über die gesamte Wirkungsgeschichte der islamischen Philosophie 
nachzudenken. Dies hängt damit zusammen, dass viele Elemente dieser Schule einerseits auf ältere Erkenntnisse zurückzuführen sind, andererseits geht es um die Korrektur, die Überwindung und Erneuerung des philosophischen Denkens. Mir geht es hier nicht darum, die ganze Traditionslinie dieser Wirkungsgeschichte zu entfalten, sondern nur einen Abriss dessen zu geben, was der Kern der Schule von Isfahan als solchen ausmacht. Die islamische Philosophie hat im Laufe ihrer Geschichte unterschiedliche Blütezeiten erlebt. Die Sonne der islamischen Philosophie ist sowohl im Orient, in Iran, als auch im Okzident, in Cordoba, aufgegangen. Die ersten Begegnungen mit den Werken des Platon und Aristoteles führten die muslimischen Gelehrten dazu, ihre eigenen philosophischen Gedanken zu entwickeln und später die philosophischen Argumente im Dienst der religiösen Wissenschaften anzuwenden. Festhalten möchte ich an dieser Stelle, dass es problematisch ist und wäre, islamische Philosophin, insbesondere Abu Nasr, Farabi, Ibn Sina sowie Suhrewardi bis hin zu Mullah Sadra als Kulmination der Schule von Isfahan auf das griechische Denken zu reduzieren. Ganz im Gegenteil, die Philosophen nehmen zwar das griechische Denken auf, geben aber weit über das hinaus, was man heute islamische Philosophie zu nennen pflegt. Die islamische Philosophie wird im Westen durch die westliche Brille gesehen und mit einem eigenen Geschichtsverständnis beurteilt. Dem entsprechend sind Orientalisten der Meinung, die Sonne der islamischen Philosophie sei mit dem Tod Ibn Rushd im Jahre 1198 untergegangen. Auch Ghazalis Ablehnungen aufgrund der dogmatischen Lehren der Ash'aritischen Schule im 12. Jahrhundert haben diese Auffassung gefestigt. Iran ist dasjenige Land, in dem die islamische Philosophie am meisten zur Entfaltung gekommen ist. Schon im 10. Jahrhundert hat der iranische Philosoph Amiri gestorben 991 versucht, den entstandenen Kontrast zwischen Theologie und Philosophie zu beseitigen. Er hat mit seinem Werk Al-Ahmad Al-Abad der islamische Philosophie eine göttliche Quelle zugeschrieben. Durch historische Faktizitäten ist es nachzuweisen, dass die Kette der islamischen Philosophen in Iran im Laufe ihrer Geschichte keine Lücke erlebt hat. Hier geht es um eine kontinuierliche Denklinie des Philosophierens. Die iranisch-islamische Philosophie stellt eine lebendige Strömung und Bewegung dar, die vom 10. bis 17. Jahrhundert angedauert und ihren Höhepunkt im 17. Jahrhundert in der Schule von Isfahan erreicht hat. Die Schule von Isfahan, eine schiitische philosophische Schule, stellt eine Kombination der vier Strömungen in der islamischen Geistesgeschichte dar. Diese vier Dimensionen der Schule von Isfahan sind die peripathetische Philosophie Ibn Sinas, die Illuminationslehre 
Sohravardis, islamische Theologie und islamische Mystik. Die Versöhnung der Theologie mit der Philosophie ist durch die Schule von Isfahan realisiert worden. Die religiöse Politik des Safaviden hat den schiitischen Gelehrten den Weg geebnet. Die Denker des 16. bis 18. Jahrhunderts haben ihre philosophischen Auffassungen in der Form zahlreicher Monographien, Kommentare und Glossen veröffentlicht. Unter den Vordenkern der Schule von Isfahan sind große Persönlichkeiten wie Nasireddin Tusi, Jalaluddin Davani, Qiyaseddin und Sadreddin Dashtaki zu erwähnen. In diesem Zusammenhang darf Ghazali nicht in Vergessenheit geraten. Seine Rolle beim Zustandekommen der Schule von Isfahan ist zwar indirekt, aber unumstritten. Obwohl Ghazali an der Philosophie Ibn Sinas Kritik übte, wurde die Philosophie von ihm durch Sufismus ersetzt. Später wurde Sufismus oder islamische Mystik neben der Philosophie und Theologie eine weitere Hauptsäule der Schule von Isfahan. Um 1600 wählte Shah Abbas die Stadt Isfahan zu seiner Hauptstadt. Isfahan verwandelte sich während dieser Herrschaft zu einer glanzvollen, glanzvollen Residenz mit schönen Palästen, prachtvollen Moscheen und großen Schulen. Die Stadt die den Glanz der religiösen Politik der Safaviden widerspiegelt, wurde der Ort, an dem die namhaftesten schiitischen Philosophen Mir Damad und sein Schüler Mullah Sadra gelebt und gewirkt haben. Durch die philosophischen Werke Mir Damads, Mullah Sadras, Feiz Kaushanis, Abdul Razak Lahijis, Mullah Rajab Ali Tabrizis und viele andere Denker und Gelehrte kam eine Vereinigung der Philosophie mit der Theologie in der Schule von Isfahan zustande. Es ist allerdings bemerkenswert, dass die Versöhnung zwischen der Philosophie und Theologie dadurch zu erkennen ist, dass die Philosophen und Denker der Isfahaner Schule zugleich Theologen, Koranausleger und gute Kenner der Hadith-Wissenschaften sind. Sowohl Vernunft und rationale Argumentation als zwei wichtige Faktoren des Kalam und der Philosophie Ibn Sinas, als auch die visionäre Schau und Intuition als wes wesentliche Elemente der Philosophie Sohrevardis und des Sufismus stehen im Mittelpunkt des Denkens der Schule von Isfahan. Der bedeutendste Vertreter der Schule von Isfahan ist, wie Eingangs erwähnt, Mullah Sadra. Er ist der Vater einer Philosophie-Neugestaltung, in der vier Denkströme auf eine neue Weise, nämlich auf sadraische Weise, zusammenfließen. Seine Werke basieren auf der langen Tradition der schiitisch-iranischen Philosophie, wobei sie keine Wiederholung sind. Der Höhepunkt der Schule von Isfahan bilden neue philosophische Auffassungen und der neue Belieg Mullah Sadras, welche neue Horizonte eröffnet haben. Die alten philosophischen Traditionen als Grundlage und Fundament sind durch Mullah Sadra mit neuen philosophischen Elementen kombiniert worden, und haben das glanzvolle Gebäude der schiitisch-iranischen Philosophie gestaltet. Diese Epoche 
ist die Spitze des philosophischen Denkens im Islam. Alle philosophischen Strömungen kommen zusammen und bilden das große Meer des menschlichen Denkens. Deswegen ist die Fortsetzung der islamischen Philosophie ohne die Schule von Isfahan nicht denkbar. Mein Ziel war, wie gesagt, in aller Kürze das zur Darstellung zu bringen, was die Isfahaner Schule ausmacht. Ich bedanke mich bei Ihnen für Ihre Aufmerksamkeit. Vielen Dank, Frau Musavi. Ist okay? Now that is the time for discussion. Uh, Mr. Mujani, we don't have any other, yeah, okay. Uh, we have uh, 20 minutes and a couple of questions, I think, uh, for the first time from this from Mr. Uh, you, you, you want to? سلام عرض کردم خدمت حضور محترم من یک کامنت رو میخوام داشته باشم به مباحث دوستان که در تایید فرمایش دوستان هست و یک پرسش تا قبل از مکتب اصفهان به طور خاص اندیشه فلسفی شیعی با دیگری آشنایی نداره یک توضیح میدم مفهوم دیگری اینجا چیست در عربی گفته می شود الانا و الاخر در اند و در انگلیسی اس اند دم ما و دیگری تا قبل از آن ما با دیگری آشنا نیستیم مکتب یمانی برای اولین بار وارد جدال با دیگری میشه یعنی به عبارتی تا به این لحظه حوزه فلسفی شیعی وارد حوزه اجتماع نشده این دوره است که کوتاه‌تر بفرمایید که به سوال بعدی هم من اشاره کنم که صحبت سر این بودش که تا قبل از دوره میرداماد و احمد عاملی حوزه فلسفی شیعه با دیگری هیچ آشنایی نداره به عبارت این گونه بگویم که هر دیگری هم که در سایه فلسفی اسلام از موسی بن میمون تا یهودی های بغداد زمانی که بحث فلسفی میکنن زیل کتگوری فلسفه اسلامی ازش یاد میشه اما برای اولین بار مفهوم دیگری وارد میدان میشه چگونه وارد میدان میشه؟ زمانی که پیون میخوره با هند بندر گوا اما بندر گوا هم نه به اعتبار صرف هم بندر گوا اگرچه میرفند, میرفند نرسکی هم آمده اندیشه فلسفی هند رو انتقال داد برای اولین بار اسواحان و حجمش بسیار گسترده است بس دیگریه اما در گوا چون پروتستان, چون پروتستان ها و کاتولیک ها وارد دنیای شرق شدن به این گستردگی مفهوم شیعه داره با دیگری آشنا میشه حدود 80 ساله که مکتب پروتستان شکل گرفته و جالبه که مکتب پروتستان به حوزه آلمان هم مرتبطه و 80 سال از عمر این گذشته این اندیشه آمده اصفهان و داره دیالوگ میکنه با پروتستان و ازش به عنوان مکتب لوتریه یاد میشه همون زمان دارن میگن مکتب لوتریه این جریان کشته میده و در اصفهان کشته داده به خاطر قضیه تکفیر یک عالم شیعی در اندولوس به خاطر که رفته با موریسکی ها ارتباط گرفته اونجا شهید میشه و موجی رو ایجاد میکنه بین ما و دیگری و بسیار جالبه که برای اولین بار فلسفه شیعی 
در گزارش های دم یا الاخر نقل میشه و کرملیت ها ذکر میکنن که به دعای خیر ما شیخ بهایی فوت کرد چون او تظاهرات را انداخت تو اصفهان علیه ما یعنی علیه دیگری بنابراین دعا کردیم که بمیره ما مرد و جالبه که این تفکر رو دیگران هم دارن نقل میکنن بنابراین شما میبینید که مکتب یمانی چقدر با این جدال داره درگیر میشه و سایر مکتب نهله های فکری فلسفی اصفهان درگیر ماجرا نیست پس این دوران دوران بسیار حساسی است دورانی است که ما حتی امروزه بدیلش را نداریم و میزان آشنایی شیخ احمد عاملی به دستگاه یهود و به دستگاه مسیحیت آنچنان بالاست و آنچنان زبردستانه هست که تا به امروز هم ما نمونه از این آشنایی فکری با دیگری رو مثالی دست کم در حوزه اندیشه فلسفی شیعی براش نداریم لذا باید یه تعمال اینجا بکنیم اما سوال آیا مکتب یمانی با مفهوم نقطه ایمن در ارتباط هست یا خیر چون نقطه ایمن رو امروز فضای دیجیتال و مجازی خیلی راحت تر میفهمه نسبت به سابق مچکرم از این کامنت شما به موضوع مکتب اصفهان و یعنی اضافه کردن این وجهه جدید و سوالتون که ظاهرا خطاب به آقای هادی زاده است دو تا سوال دیگه داریم ما توی ایتس اوکی خیلی کوتاه بفرمایید اگر این نکته رو که سوال آقای دکتر وسی هست آقای چهارش بین بس می‌فرمان که خیلی کوتاه عرض بکنم خدمتتون ببینید این ارتباط که فرمودید خیلی عمیق‌تر و کهن‌تر از این تاریخه اصفهان حقیقتا در حوزه فلسفه اسلامی جایگاه آتن رو در فلسفه یونانی داره ارتباطات از زمان خود شیخ الرئیس و سفرهای بعضی از تلامیزه ایشون از مناطق هند به ایران شروع شده و بعضی از عناصر اشراقی موجود در فلسفه بوالی و حتی فلسفه آثار متقدم بر ایشون به ویژه اگر بپذیریم که فصوص الحکمه مربوط به فارابی هست اگر نپذیریم کما این که بعضی نمیپذیرند که هیچ اما اگر بپذیریم که فصوص الحکمه یا فصوص الحکم از تعریفات فارابی هست اون وقت تاریخ برخورد فلسفه, فلسفه اسلامی با عناصر شرقی اقلا هفت قرن عقبتر از این تاریخ خواهد بود الا این که بفرمایید اصلا فارابی چنین کتابی ننوشته الا اینکه بفرمایید که اصلا فارابی چنین کتابی ننوشته و ایشون از اندیشه های غیر الهیاتی برخورداره و از اندیشه های غیر توحیدی یا حتی عدم قائل به وجود سانع برخورداره و حالا باید با یک رنگ عرفانی تفسیر دیگری ازش بشه علای حال اناسر حکمت یمانی به صورت مختصر عرض بکنم متاسفانه خیلی تفسیر نشده خیلی موجود نیست ولی زا از ماهیتش به اون صورت کامل به جز بعضی از نقطه های معروف مثل حدوث دهری و اینها اطلاع چندانی در دست نداریم ولی زا چیستی این حکمت و اناسر اصلیش خب خیلی مفصله و در این یک دقیقه ای که می‌فرمایند توضیح بیشتری نمیشه براش عرض کرد در خدمت شما 
A uh, couple of quick questions for Dr. Javadi. First of all, one, uh, thank you for your wonderful presentation. You mentioned about the lack of development of practical theology. Would this be connected to what I was saying yesterday, the uh, lack of connection between values and uh, the jurisprudence, Islamic fiqh? In other words, there is a dissonance, if you like, between Islamic law and the values that the Quran and others espouse. The second question is, what would be the link, if any, between the new, uh, the practical theology that you are talking of and what is called kalam e jadid the new theology? Thank you. Yes, uh, question. I think that, uh, you, know, um, you know, the task of jurisprudence is just to explaining the duties and not, you know, defending because Suppose that the people believe in God and believe in the prophet and believe in the text, so they, they want only to give the details of the text and uh, sort of textual reasoning. But when we come to you know, the sphere of value or you know, normativity, we have another question. Uh, to find the reason for these values and these you know, duties, these obligations. So I think uh, what we have not in our history is the discussion of value in this, uh, you know, this respect, not the discussion of duties or discussion of the you know, obligations. So uh, we have not uh, good and detailed discussions of the, the normativity, of the value of the uh, duties or, val or, or the reasons for obligations. This is the, uh, I, I think this is, uh, you know, uh, we have the basics of this uh, sort of uh, the knowledge or discussion in our uh, text in the Nabil Quran, in the, you know, the narrations, but mainly it uh, needs to be discussed, to be uh, you know, argumented. This is the idea in <coughs> with regard to the f uh, relation of value to jurisprudence. But, but, but uh, for the second question, I think that uh, Practical theology, uh, also in the you know modern theology, is neglected mainly. Modern theology, uh, you, if you see, for example, the philosophy of religion books or modern theology, you also uh, see the lack of the lack of the you know practical issues. They are mostly talking about the you know theoretical issue and problem, not about the justice, not about the yes. We have another sort of. Uh, discussion, but it is not included in the modern theology books. They are, we have uh, other sorts of, uh, the nor they are included in moral or ethics books, not in the, you know, not in the title of uh, modern theology. Modern theology also <laughs> followed the same way of the, you know, the old theology, mainly concerned with the theoretical issues, not practical issues. I'm not sure I understood your <laughs> question correctly. Time just to, for, for two questions, one by Dr. Subhani and the other by Mohammed, Mohammed Amir. First, uh, yeah, just a microphone. Yeah, the microphone. Yeah, uh, the question is about Dr. Javadi. You know, in the context of the conversation, the question is whether the question is whether the question is whether the question is تأکید بر دفاع شما خیلی داشتید به نظرم نه تاریخ کلام ما انحصار به دفاع داره و نه حداقل وضعیت کنونی که ما در دنیا داریم این مفهوم دفاع درش خیلی معنا میده امروز حتی کلام نظری هم رفته به سمت دفاع های از سنف سنخ توصیف و اینها این به نظر من یه مقدار این بود ای دفاعیش رو کم کنیم کلام هم گسترده تر میشه در حوزه کاربردی و هم شاید نافذتر باشه اما سال هستیم اینه ببینید نسبت به اینکه چرا کلام کاربردی توسعه پیدا نکرده شما چهار دلیل رو یا چهار زمینه رو اشاره کردید که بیشتر هم شاید تاکید بر این بود هم تو که الان فرمودید ترس از طرح چنین پرسش هایی آشنایی من حداقل نسبت به تاریخ تفکر ما این رو تایید نمیکنه یعنی وقتی جدی ترین پرسش ها نسبت به خدا و نبوت مطرح میشه فرمودن در مدرسه اصفهان به صراحت مستبشران مسیحی کتاب علیه اسلام می نویسن 
اینکه یک کسی در مورد مثلا مسئله حجاب یا بردهداری و امثال ناس آلکل اصلا خوفی وجود نداشته اشکال اصلی به یه چیز دیگه برمیگرده اشکال اصلی این است که هم تو شما اشاره کردید تکیگاه اصلی کلام ما از قرون میانه رفت روی فلسفه فلسفه مصطلح اسلامی و فلسفه اسلامی باز به خوبی تاکید کردید که در حوزه فلسفه عملی بسیار ضعیف بود و اینم دلایل داره قابل بحثه من عامل اصلی ضعف کلام کاربردی رو در سنت اسلامی تکیه بر فلسفه اسلامی میدانم و ضعف بنیادین فلسفه اسلامی در تبیین های حوزه کاربردی دین و اعتقادم این است که اساسا فلسفه نمیتواند در حوزه جزئیات و موضوعات شریعت که کار کلام کاربردی است ورود روش شناختی داشته باشد یه نکته نسبت مدرسه اصفهان هم دو نکته خیلی کوتاه عرض کنم از عوامل یا اسباب تاثیر در مدرسه اصفهان خیلی گفته شد و درست هم هست اما دو تا شخصیت رو نباید سهمشون رو در اصفهان فراموش کنیم یک عالم سنی به نام فخر رازی که به گمانم به صورت غیر مستقیم و مستقیم در تمام متفکران اصفهانیشون موثر بوده مخصوصا در ملا صدرا و شخصیت دوم ابن عبی جمهور احسای عالم شیعی که الگوی ترکیبی تفکر کلام و عرفان و فلسفه رو به نظرم اولین بار او بنا نهاد اینم ای در نظر گرفته خیلی خوبه خانم دکتر موسوی اشاره کردن که نماینده مهمترین نماینده اصفهان ملو صدراست اینم من تردید دارم ملو صدرا نماینده مدرسه اصفهان نیست ممکنه بگیم از ثمرات مدرسه اصفهان هست بگیم اوج اینا دیگه داوری های ارزشی است کسانی در اصفهان وجود دارن ملا صدرا رو قبول ندارن یعنی مدرسه اصفهان شناخته نمیشه اگه بخوایم تاریخی نگاه کنیم نه امروزی ما داریم از دریچه امروز اصفهان رو قرائت میکنیم اگه برگردیم در اصفهان اون دور زندگی کنیم اصلا ملا صدرا در فلسفه اصفهان نمایندگی نمیکنه ملا صدرا نمیتونه توی اصفهان بمونه امواج مختلف نقد بر مولا صدرا مولا صدرا تقریبا باید بگیم 60 سال بعد 70 سال بعد از خودش تازه آثارش خونده میشه شاگردان او و دو داماد او فیض و فیاض اندیشه مولا صدرا رو نمیپذیرن گرچه فیض گاهی قرائت میکنه تقریر میکنه به نظر من اعتقادی چندانی به اندیشه نداره فیاض هم که به کلی رد میکنه Uh, thank you, Mr. Sopani, for three comments. Uh, because we have uh, very little time, I would like to, um, Dr. Mohammed Amer, to yeah. give his his comment or question, and then we can uh, conclude the presentation. Okay. Just a moment for the microphone. Yeah. This one. I have a very short question for Frau Dr. Sadiga. Um, in Zusammenhang mit Asfahn-Schule. Es geht darum, dass nur die Expertin können den Unterschied äh, einfach äh, bemerken zwischen Al-Ghazali und Al-Ghazali und äh, Ibn Sina, wenn man redet über den äh, Unterschied zwischen Philosophie und Al-Kalam. Aber da, bei den bei der meisten Leuten äh, wissen die Muslime gar nicht, was ist der Unterschied zwischen äh, Al-Kalam und der Philosophie, wenn man redet über Al-Ghazali und Ibn Sina. Und deswegen, das ist, das ist eine, eine, um das zu verbinden mit nur Asfahan Schule, wäre das unfair mit anderen Schulen, die existiert vor Asfahan Schule. Als ob, ich habe, ich habe so äh, äh, verstanden, als ob äh, vor Asfahan Schule gab es keine Philosophie und Al-Kalam mit äh, Ja. Vielleicht, wenn ich also bei Ihnen diesen Eindruck gemacht habe, aber natürlich, das war nicht gemeint. Nein, also ich habe auch äh, auf die also Vordenker der Isfahaner Schule also hingewiesen, nämlich also Dashtaki und Davani, diese waren also die Schule von Shiraz, die philosophische Schule von Shiraz. Nein, natürlich, also gab es, ich habe auch das betont, dass diese Kette nie eine Lücke gehabt hat. Die Kette der islamischen Philosophie von vom 10. Jahrhundert, wenn wir also einen Iraner als Beispiel also nennen, also Ahmedi nämlich, 
im 17. Jahrhundert bis zum 17. Jahrhundert, diese, diese Lücke gab es nie. Aber was in den westlichen Forschungen gemeint ist, es ist Sie wissen, bis Hälfte, bis, also Hälfte des zweiten des 20. Jahrhunderts war man die Meinung, dass also islamische Philosophie nämlich abgebrochen ist mit dem Tod Ibn Rushd, also Ende des 12. Jahrhunderts. Und auch diese Attacke, Ghazalis Attacke auf Ibn Sinas Philosophie hat auch inzwischen eine Rolle gespielt. Also ich, ich für meine Person denke, dass das, das muss wieder neu gelesen werden. Ja. We have just three minutes uh, to uh, reach the coffee break. Uh, just one minute for each person to comment uh, to the question of uh, Mr. Sob Dr. Sobhani very shortly. Uh, سمره فلسفی حوزه اصفهان هست اما نماینده حوزه اصفهان به اون معنا که نشون دهنده این حوزه باشه نیست اشتهار ایشون هم تقریبا 150 سال بعد با حضور آقا محمد بیدابادی و بعد ملا علی نوری و تقریبا 120 سال عمر ملا علی و هفتاد سال تمام تدریس آرا و آثار صدر المتعلهین شروع شده منتها سمره همینجور که خانم دکتر فرمودن بالاترین سمره حوزه فلسفی اسفهان صدر المتعلهین بوده اگرچه نماینده این حوزه نیست اما برترین سمره حوزه فلسفی اسفهان ایشون هست فرمایش دیگری به خاطرم نمون متاسفانه در خدمتون هست Uh, when he was talking about, uh, you know, a theoretical issue, he, he was the friend of the Muwahidi ruler. But uh, when he started to talk about the justice or uh, other practical issue, so they killed him. This is the reason for uh, my, you know, answer. Uh, but yes, you are right. Some, I'm not sure about, I, I don't, you know, believe in that uh, all the case happened, for example, in Iran or in, but Mainly these are the answers for the absence of practical consideration in philosophy and theology in the history of Islam. The last one is by Sajjad. Uh, maybe, maybe from Sajjad. Sajjad, would you like to give some... some? take it too long. But let me just mention one thing. I mean, without um, sounding a bit too kind of arrogant, um, I would refer you to three things I've written. <laughs> the first is, I've written an article in the Encyclopedia Iranica on the School of Isfahan, where basically I, I question the very notion. I don't think there was a such a thing as a School of Isfahan. Uh, and it fundamentally goes back to this issue of what do we mean by school? Uh, and for that, I would refer you to uh, extensive discussions on what do we mean by Platonism in a much earlier period. The second thing is on the establishment of, uh, of Mullah Sadr. Again, I've written an article on Ali Nuri and one on, on Hajmullah Hadith Abzawari, which I think demonstrates how the establishment of Mullah Sadr in the curriculum happened. So I'd be happy to send you those articles if you wish. Thank you uh, for your uh, patience here. Uh, and uh, now the time uh, is the time for coffee break. And we will be back here after 20 minutes for the next panel. Thank you. Thank you.